I spend much too much time reading dictionaries. And that, I admit, is largely because I'm a very lonely man. But I would also recommend other people to read dictionaries. They, they can be wonderful, wonderful things. I mean, obviously, the storyline isn't that powerful. And um, the characterization is not much. But it does have all the words in it. If you think about it, every other book written is just a rearrangement, a partial rearrangement of the dictionary. And I can look at dictionaries for hours because I can just open it and I see one word I think that I don't know. I can um, cross-reference it to another word and I drift along and look at my watch and discover that it's Tuesday and I've wasted an awful lot of time. But I do love to find out where words come from. And sometimes it's a, a very simple origin that you didn't think of. For example, a fan, as in a fan of a pop group or a fan of a, a sports club, and that's just short for fanatic. It's a very simple process. And you also have um, uh, phrases which uh, people don't realize uh, where they come from. For example, a turn up for the books, a very familiar English language phrase. And I always assumed that it was something to do with books, quite obviously. But in fact, a turn up for the books is a turn up for the bookmakers. It's a betting term. Because when a, um, an outsider, outside her chance horse comes in and wins the race, that means that the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, people, most people who bet on the favorite will lose. And the bookmakers do very, very well. And I didn't realize that. Often things, often things have a meaning which is an, or an origin which is completely different to what you thought. For example, the Rolling Stones, one of the most famous rock groups. They're famous for being wild and crazy rockers. And uh, one would imagine that that came from, where, where does the phrase Rolling Stone come from? And it, uh, there is a phrase in the English language, a Rolling Stone gathers no moss. Um, which I always imagined was a stone rolling slowly uh, down a hill, you know, bouncing from crag to crag, which is quite an exciting thing and a good thing to name a rock group after. But I was wrong. A rolling stone is like a lawnmower, or it's what you use after a lawnmower. First of all, you mow your lawn, and then, especially if on a cricket pitch, you take out a rolling stone and you roll that slowly along the grass on the cricket pitch and that rolling stone if it's often used should gather no moss so the rolling stones are actually named after that piece of gardening equipment that is used that you will see um between um sessions on a cricket pitch um which is probably not what they intended but they probably didn't know there are so many hidden connections and that's what i love to find um a similar one would be, uh, for example, a little line of connections here. There's uh, the nu nuclear bombs. We've all heard of nuclear bombs. And uh, the first hydrogen bomb test, which is a lot more powerful than an atom bomb, occurred in uh, Bikini Atoll in the South Pacific. There was a little coral reef island, and the USA tested their hydrogen bomb there. And it was a massive international incident, caused a lot of controversy. Um, all around the world, people reacted with fear, with um, excitement, with hatred, with wondering where humanity is going. And the French, of course, didn't react like that. They reacted by designing some new beachwear for women. And they decided, as it was so hot, this new beachwear, so very, very hot, they decided to name it after the nuclear tests of Bikini Atoll, which is why women, to this day, wear bikinis. It's named after the nuclear test site. And um, just on the other side of that, uh, the word atoll actually comes from Malayalam. Um, uh, I, my pronunciation will never work on this, I'm afraid. But the word to enclose in Malayalam is uh, atoll, uh, some, something along the... I, I was taught it just now in the green room, but I, I'm afraid I, I, um, my pronunciation will never work on this. But there, these words drift all across the globe very, very quickly. A similar one is um, the, the uh, English word catamaran for a double-hulled boat comes from the Portuguese catamaran, which comes from the Malayalam, and again, I shall get the pronunciation horribly wrong, uh, catamaram, which means um, wood bound together and uh, solid together. So you have these, these words which can move so quickly around the world and completely uh, often change their meanings. One of my favorite stories is about um, the Hormel Food Company Incorporated of the United States of America. And in the 1930s, they introduced a new product to the market, and it was tinned meat. To be precise, it was spiced ham. And so they decided to call this tinned meat product Spam. 
and they sold it in shops around America, and it did quite well. And then it became a worldwide success because of Adolf Hitler. You see, um, what Adolf Hitler did was he started the Second World War, and that meant that um, Britain couldn't feed itself, so we had to import food in convoys from North America. And the food we needed very desperately was meat, and they had tinned meat, which could be preserved. So those North Atlantic convoys in the Second World War were largely just bringing huge amounts of tinned meat, or spiced ham, or spam, as it was called, to Britain. And a spam became an integral part of the British diet, especially the British working class diet. If you went into a cheap cafe or something, they would often serve you spam. And as a result of that, we now get to Monty Python. Um, I don't know how popular Monty Python ever was over here, but um, uh, Monty Python did a sketch in which a man goes into a cheap cafe and he asks what's on the menu. And the woman says to him, we've got uh, boiled Spam, roast Spam, fried Spam, grilled Spam, Spam with Spam, Spam on the side, Spam, and goes on and on and on like this. And for some reason, because it's the surreal comedy of Monty Python, um, at the back of the cafe, there's a bunch of Vikings sitting at a table who start singing a song. And they go, Spam, 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 and will not stop. Now, for some reason, Monty Python is very popular with computer programmers. Indeed, there is a whole computer programming language called Python. And as a result of that, when the internet was in its very early days, and we're talking about the 1980s here, there was a standard practical joke amongst computer enthusiasts of sending your friend a computer program. The computer program essentially had two lines of code. It would be print the word spam on the screen, second line, go back to the first line. So if you open this program up, your computer screen will be filled with the words spam, 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 just like in the Monty Python sketch. And as a result, the word spam became the standard computing term for an email that you didn't want. And that's why we still get, to this day, our inboxes filled with spam email. It's, and it's also still, oddly enough, a registered trademark of Hormel Food Company, because it was only invented in America as a form of food um, 80 years ago. Um, and but incidentally, Hormel Food Company are quite proud of this, and they are just like to insist that it's uh, spelt with capital letters, because it is their registered trademark. Just as, for example, um, heroin, I didn't know if you know this, was a regular <laughs> um, a trademark of the um, biopharmaceutical company that invented heroin back in the 1890s when it was originally invented as a non-addictive substitute for morphine, um, which uh, that one didn't really work out, but that was the intention of heroin. Um, and you get these strange, strange connections which run all acr across uh, seemingly disparate words. Uh, for example, there is... Um, uh, film buffs, why would you have a film buff? And the answer is it's short for buffalo, um, which maybe you wouldn't have thought of, but uh, back in, uh, uh, buffaloes obviously are, have skin, and if you've got skin, that skin can be turned into leather, and buffalo leather was the standard leather that was used to polish things once upon a time, especially in uh, Victorian uh, England, uh, you would take your buffalo leather, or short for that, it would be buff, and you would buff things up, and that's why you still buff something until it shines, and you still buff uh, something until you're an expert on it. And also, it's why if you go to the gym and get yourself a really good-looking body which gleams and shines, you look very buff. And it's also because the Victorians were very, very prudish and um, didn't like to talk about anything sexual at all and also didn't even want to mention that somebody was naked, they um, invented the euphemism for naked because uh, buff leather is roughly the uh, color of skin. They would refer to somebody as being dressed in the buff, meaning not dressed at all, which is why we have in the buff. But there were one group of people who always dressed in the buff, and that was uh, firefighters. Uh, because buff leather is very good, it's flame retardant, it's very good at keeping off f um, fire if you're fighting it. And so the firefighters of uh, London and New York, New York importantly, were referred to as the buffs because they all dressed in buff leather. And weirdly in New York it used to be a fun activity for boys, little boys, to go and watch fires being put out. There were enough fires going on that the boys of New York could run over 
and watch their favorite firefighters fighting fires. And they would know their names in roughly the same way that um, boys now know the names of famous cricketers or Premier League footballers. They would know the names of all the firefighters and they would cheer them on. And these boys were known as the buffs, the enthusiasts for um, watching houses burn down, which is a strange, strange kind of um, hobby. But that's why you now have film buffs and music buffs and indeed etymology buffs. It's all short for buffalo and it all comes from that same origin. And I'm uh, just going to uh, give you a little reading now, um, just to give you another idea of how many words can be connected. Um, this is about under the chapter, it's called The Scampering Champion of the Champagne Campaign. According to legend, the beautiful elder sister of truth, Champagne was invented by a Benedictine monk called Dom Perignon, who shouted to his fellow monks, come quickly, I am tasting the stars. This is, of course, balderdash. Making sparkling wine is simple. It's bottling it that was difficult. If you put fizzy wine in a normal bottle, it, can it can't take the pressure and explodes. A champagne bottle has to contain six atmospheres of pressure. Even now, the caverns of Moet and Chandon lose every 60th bottle to explosion. Moreover, it was English glassmakers who perfected the method in order to keep their cider fizzy, and the French simply stole the technology to bottle their bubbly. Champagne was originally just vin de campagne, or wine from the countryside. It was only in the 18th century that it came to refer to wine from the particular region around Epernay, where many of the worst bits of the First World War happened. That champagne saw some of the worst trench warfare is no coincidence. The German advance of 1914 started very well. They stormed across northern France with Teutonic efficiency until they got to the champagne warehouses. There's something about finding the whole world's champagne supply that can make even a German commander find reasons for pausing, and the pause was all that the French and British needed. The Allies arrived, everybody dug trenches, and the rest is war poetry. The German campaign took place during the summer. It had to. When winter arrives, armies generally have to find somewhere warm to hole up and wait for the snows and the gales to pass. Then, in the spring, they can set out into the campagna again, which is why an army fights a summer campaign, literally on the countryside. Campagna comes from the Latin word campus, which meant field. The very best soldiers in the field were called the campiones, from which we get champion. A champagne campaign would be the same thing through, uh, so the champion of a champagne campaign would be the same thing three times over. You can do a lot of things with the field. You can, for example, build a university on it, in which case you have a university campus. But what most campaigning armies do is simply take out their tents and guy ropes and pitch a camp. Actually, there's another thing that armies usually do. Armies are mostly composed of men, young men, without any women to keep them company. This means that soldiers have every reason in the world to try to sneak out of the camp to seek the solace of sex. Creeping out of camp was called ex campare by the Romans and escampe by the French, but we call it scampering. The ladies towards whom these young champions would be scampering were the camp followers, women of more enterprise and virtue who would follow the soldiers around and rent their affections by the hour. Camp followers aren't the classiest of broads. A broad, by the way, is a woman who is abroad. They tended to wear too much makeup to be truly ladylike, and their dresses were garish and their hair badly dyed. During the First World War, British soldiers started to call such a get-up campy. They also referred to such illicit sexual scamperings as camp. From here, the word camp had to make only a short hop before it referred to men in makeup and maybe a dress who had illicit sexual encounters. And that's why men in makeup are to this day camping it up with a glass of pink champagne. Camp, in the sense of battlefield, also wheedled its way into German as Kampf, meaning battle. So Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, could reasonably be described as rather camp. And so it goes on and on and on. I was once, I, I become obsessed with this sort of thing. I was once in, um, uh, in Rome on holiday and I was going around all the wonderful sites. And one of the things to see in Rome, an uh, amazing thing, is the Capuchin crypt. The Capuchins were an order of monks. And rather than be buried, um, they, when they died, their 
bones, their skeletons, were taken and used as interior decorations in this underground crypt. It's one of the freakiest, weirdest places I've ever visited. You have to queue up and pay and you go down and it's just rooms filled with skulls but arranged into pretty patterns and lampshades made out of hip bones. It's really very, very odd. And all I could think of, because I'm a weirdo, all I could think of as I was walking around this crypt filled with human bones was Capuchin monks, cappuccino. Capuchin, cappuccino, cappuccin, cappuccino, cappuccin, ca there must be some kind of a connection. And indeed, when I finally got out of that crypt and um, uh, uh, got myself to a dictionary, I discovered that cappuccinos are called that because the uh, cappuccino is the same lovely brown color, light brown color, as the robes of a capuchin monk. So the one is named after the other. And I thought, wow, capuchin monk, cappuccino, capuchin monk. And then I thought, capuchin monkeys. There's a kind of monkey called the capuchin monkey. And I thought, it can't be monk, monkey. The funny thing is that in medieval times, Nowadays, we'd probably think of a monk as a wonderful holy fellow who um, renounces all worldly goods and things and goes off to meditate. But in medieval times, monasteries were um, the richest institutions in Europe. And so if the monks had all the food and all the money, and they also therefore had their fair share of the women, and they had a very, very bad reputation in medieval Europe as the worst sinners that there were. Indeed, the very first, actually, oh, the, the very, the, the second reference to the F word, I don't want to swear on stage either, because uh, is um, ever is uh, in a poem about uh, how monks, what monks do to housewives in the English city of Ely. Um, so they had a very bad reputation, and they wandered around wearing brown robes and um, trying to, um, you know, just eat and have sex all the time. And as a result, in the age of exploration, as explorers from uh, Britain started going around the world, and they found these little, funny little animals, these human-like creatures, but they were just filthy things in brown fur, and they just seemed to try to have sex all the time. They named them monkeys after monks. That's where the English word monkey comes from, because monks had such a bad reputation. And then, <laughs> when they found the species of capuchin monkeys, they found this one species which has, it looks, the markings on it look like it's wearing a hood, like a capuchin monk does. And so they call them capuchin monkeys. So capuchin monks and capuchin monkeys is the same term twice over. Especially if they're drinking a cappuccino, in which case it's the same term three times over. But you also have another wonderful thing that you have in dictionaries. I always... I always, um, whenever I write a speech, I make it the wrong length. So um, I, either I'll underrun by 10 minutes or I'll overrun by two hours. You can pray that it's the former. Um, you find these beautiful words which have fallen out of use for some reason, but are still so lovely. Well, one of my favorite words is in the English language is the word gongoozle. And you'll find this word in the Oxford English Dictionary. There it is with its definition, which is to stare idly at a canal or other watercourse and do nothing. You think, wow, that's a beautifully specific word, or weirdly specific word. But actually, I live near a canal in London, and whenever you walk along it, there's always people just sitting on a bench, just gazing at the canal and doing nothing. And in fact, after this festival is over, I'm hoping to take a boat on the backwaters of Kerala and do some really serious, energetic gongoozling just staring idly at canals and doing nothing. There is a word for absolutely everything in, in the world. For example, the, the, the little plastic bit on the end of your shoelace, that is called an aglet. The industry term in the toothpaste industry, there really is a term for the small amount of toothpaste that you squeeze out onto your toothbrush. It is called one nurdle of toothpaste. Absolutely unrelated to the cricket term, by the way. But um, there was a recently a um, 
two of the, the two biggest uh, toothpaste manufacturers in the world had some uh, massive court case about the use of a particular image of a nerdle in manufacturing. And all the court papers which were filed in New York, which I had a nice brief glance through, were all about nerdles and what nerdles could be shown. And we alleged that this nerdle was originally our nerd. I, I, I was laughing so much I had to leave the British Library, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> And then you have uh, words which are so useful, we really should still be using the words like to snudge, which is to um, make a big show at work of actually doing something where, of, when, you, in fact, you're not. Um, in fact, there are several words meaning that. Um, there's also fudgel, pretend to be working when you aren't doing a damn thing. And these words should, should be brought back. because Sometimes it can, be, it can be a comfort to uh, realize that other people have the same... Uh, experiences that you do. I found there's a word, of an old English word, utkiara. And utkiara means to lie awake before dawn, worrying about the day to come. And I suffer from utkiara all the time. And to discover that this word has been around for over a thousand years, but only ever used once by one Anglo-Saxon poem called The Wife's Lament. And it gives you a, that sense of, um, you, that, of connection with somebody else. Uh, a connection that you... Um, you might get with um, the, the old Scottish term, uh, to groke. To groke is to stare at somebody whilst they're eating in the hope that they will give you some of their food. Now, originally that was only applied to um, uh, dogs. Anyone who's ever owned a dog will know that feeling. Um, <laughs> but it could equally be applied to, you know, if you open a nice box of chocolates in the office and um, everybody comes to gather around your desk just groking. And groking. It's a related term to um, a footenide, which is, um, that's not an English word, that's a German word, but a very useful one. Footenide means literally uh, food envy or fodder envy. And it's the feeling you get in a restaurant when you realize the other person has ordered something way nicer than you. So related, a related English term, a proper English term, is scambling. And a scambler is somebody who, when he knows that you are paying the bill, orders the most expensive thing on the menu. And everybody knows a scambler. Everyone here knows a scambler. If you don't know a scambler, that's probably because you are a scambler. Um, and there's some of these words just sound so lovely. There's an old English word, um, womble cropped, which means um, to be overcome with indigestion. If you just have a, uh, if your stomach is just turning a bit, you have a touch of the wambles. But if you are so, um, so, uh, so your indigestion is so bad that you can't stand up, then you are womble cropped. And it's just beautiful to say it flows out of the mouth. And it, it's a word you can, you can almost chew on. And then there are other words that, that, that imply a different time and a different place in a society that I will never know. For example, there is a, an old Scottish Lanarkshire word, uh, verb, to sprunt. And to sprunt, sprunting being the activity, sprunt being the verb, uh, to sprunt was to, to chase the girls around among the haystacks after dark. And I would dearly have loved to live in a time and a place where that activity was so common that somebody said, you know what, we really need a single syllable verb for this. This one little activity. And you, it's obvious why that one has died out. Not so obvious why the word snollygoster doesn't get used anymore. Snollygoster is an old term for it. It means a dishonest politician. So I can only assume from the fact that that has died that they, all politicians, are now utterly and completely honest. Um, I'm going to give you another little reading. Um, I think I shall... Oh, that's in the wrong place. <laughs> Uh, I shall do a little bit about um, computer terminology, if I can find it. Oh, a connection, the connection between um, guns and Bluetooth. This chapter is called Fat Gun Hilda. While Britain was developing the tank, Germany was building a gun. To be precise, um, Germany was building an absolutely enormous gun. It weighed 43 tons and could fire 1,800-pound shells two and a half miles. Its name was the L12 42-centimeter Type M Great Kurzermodin Kanona. But that's hardly the catchiest of names. So the designers at Krupp Armaments did a dastardly thing. They named it after their boss. The owner of the company was a fat woman called Bertha. Bertha Krupp. 
So the engineers called their new gun Dick Bertha, which is German for Fat Bertha, or as it came to be known more alliteratively in English and amongst the English soldiers, Big Bertha. It's odd to give a cannon a girl's name. You hardly need to be a devoted disciple of Sigmund Freud to see a smidgen of phallic symbolism in a gun. However, history and Freud are at odds. Sorry, did I turn two pages? No, I didn't. Uh, however, history and Freud are at odds. For some reason, guns are always girls. During the Vietnam War, recruits into the US Marine Corps were required to give their rifles girls' names, usually the name of their sweetheart at home, but the practice is much older than that. The standard issue flintlock musket of the British Empire was called Brown Bess, and Rudyard Kipling joked that many men had been pierced to the heart by her charms. In Edinburgh Castle, there's a huge medieval cannon known as Mons Meg, which was probably named after James III of Scotland's wife, Margaret. Why do guns have girls' names? It's a silly question, because gun itself is a girl's name. So far as anybody can tell, the very first gun in history was a cannon in Windsor Castle. A document from the early 14th century mentions una magna balista de cornu quae vacatur dominal Gunhilda, which means a large cannon from Cornwall, which is called Queen Gunhilda. Gunhilda is a girl's name, and the usual shortening of Gunhilda is Gunna. So far as etymology can tell, every gun in the English-speaking world is named after that one Gunna in Windsor Castle, the Queen Gunhilda. There actually was a Queen Gunhilda as well, but what did she have to do with smartphones? Gunhilda was the Queen of Denmark in the late 10th and early 11th century. She was married to Sven Forkbeard, and as is the way with Dark Age queens, that's all we really know about her. She was the mother of Canute the Great, and presumably she helped her husband out with his beard every morning. She must also have known her father-in-law, King Harold I of Denmark, who lived from 935 to 986 AD. King Harold had blue teeth, or perhaps he had black teeth. Nobody's quite sure as the meaning of blau has changed over the years. His other great achievement, achievement was to unite the warring provin provinces of Denmark and Norway under a single king himself. In 1996, a fellow called Jim Kardach developed a system that would allow mobile telephones to communicate with computers. After a hard day's engineering, Kardach relaxed by reading a historical novel called The Long Ships by Franz Gunnar Bengston. It's about Vikings and adventure and raping and pillaging and looting, and it's set during the reign of Harold Bluetooth. Jim Kardach felt he was doing the king's work by getting computers to talk to telephones and vice versa. He was uniting the warring provinces of technology. So, just for his own amusement, he gave the project the working title of Bluetooth. Bluetooth was never meant to be the actual name on the package. Blue teeth aren't a pleasant image, and it was up to the marketing men at Kardash's company to come up with something better. The marketing men did come up with something much blander and more saleable. They were going to call the product Pan. Unfortunately, just as the new technology was about to be unveiled, they realized that Pan was already the trademark of another company. So as time was tight and the product needed to be launched, they reluctantly went with Kardash's nickname, and that's why it's called Bluetooth technology. So between a father-in-law and a daughter-in-law, all guns and Bluetooth technology are named after that little family unit who didn't know either of those technologies. And I'm going to finish up today just with a, a, a little story that, that I hope illustrates all of this. I was, uh, yesterday, I was taken out by some of the lovely organizers of the festival. We went to uh, Zam Zam, I think it was. Um, uh, Zam Zam restaurant, which is a, uh, a, a, an Arab uh, Middle Eastern restaurant. And um, it, it turns out every, everyone here likes um, uh, Arabic food, which is strange, because when I was in Dubai, which is the only bit of Arabia I visited, all the restaurants serve Western food. And when I'm in Britain, we just love Indian food. Um, so there's some kind of circle going on. But I just want to um, explain uh, why I ate the word naked yesterday. Um, <laughs> the word naked in English, because English can be traced back until it um, joins up with um, Latin and Greek and other languages, basically 6,000 years ago, about 4,000 BC, there were some people who probably lived uh, uh, somewhere near the Caspian Sea, 
They were probably the Kurgan pit burial culture, and they spread out in all directions to, um, to northern Europe, to uh, the Italian peninsula, to the Greeks, um, and they were speaking a language called, um, which is called Proto-Indo-European, um, which doesn't survive, but we can see, because they also arrived in India, we can see that, uh, northern India, this is, that all the languages, all the northern Indian languages and European languages, are all related. They all come from this same original language, which is just before records began. Sanskrit's close to it, and so is ancient Greek, and so is Latin. Um, therefore, you can, and Old English, uh, English all comes from it. So um, the English word naked, if you go back, it comes, goes back to the... Uh, the Proto-Indo-European root um, uh, nagt, which also went into Latin as nude, so naked and nude are connected, which makes a lot of sense. But it also um, it went, went into Persian. Um, the Persians used to do most of their cookery by burying, they would cook meat by burying it within the ashes of a fire. But um, bread, they would cook uncovered. They would um, put it on top of the ashes. So it was uncovered. So it was essentially naked on top of the fire. And so they went from the word narked to the word um, naan, referring to bread, meaning that which was cooked uncovered or in the nude. And therefore, as it were, naked bread. And then that went into um, the Indian languages. And that's why yesterday, sitting in Zamzam in Trivandrum, I was eating a naan bread which was connected to my old English word, naked. And I love that connection. I love the way language, which can seem so varied, binds us all together in these ways that we never understood. And you can only really understand this by reading dictionaries, because dictionaries are beautiful. And dictionaries, as the word, uh, as the French author Anatole of France once said, a dictionary is the universe in alphabetical order. Thank you very much. Mark, have you uh, investigated the genesis of the word guy that is being used extensively all around the world? And oh, to God. me, it is a lazy pronunciation of something much more important. Uh, guy as in G-U-Y, to, to mean person. You know, I never have. I should have done. Um, I know that chap means customer. It's cognate with the word cheap, because uh, you went to a, a, a cheap was originally a market, and a chap was a person who went to a market, and cheap was the price you got at the market. But do you know where guy comes from? No? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I'm afraid I've, I've never checked up on guy for some reason. Um, it, I've, I would take a guess that it would, I mean, I, I'd need to check up, but I'd take a guess it's just because it's a man's name. There's a man standing up to the back and gesturing. I believe it comes from the English Jesuit Guy Fawkes, yeah. uh, who in 1605 was part of a plot against King James. Yeah. And uh, the English celebrated uh, the suppression of Guy Fawkes' rebellion by ritually burning a guy they still on a bonfire a bit, every yeah. year. And that sort of passed into English as a term for any guy. That sounds pretty convincing. I do know there's a lovely story about when Guy Fawkes was arrested originally and they demanded his name and he had to give a false name and think it up very quickly. And the false name he said uh, was, well, it, presumably he said it like this. They said, what's your name? He said, John. And they said, what's your surname? He said, Johnson. <laughs> And that was the name he gave. So it, it could very well be Guy Fawkes. Um, there is a lot of that. Although it might just be uh, on the model of Tom, Dick, and Harry, this um, uh, just uh, uh, a man's name, a generic man's name. Your average John Doe or J Joe Bloggs. The average Joe. Do you think that cognitive universe evolved because of linguistic diaspora? The corrective universe the cognitive Cogn universe the cognitive universe oh. is so are you asking with i mean there's a, a great big question in philosophy linguistics etc of whether having a word allows us to have a thought or whether um the thoughts come first and then the words do is that is that roughly what you mean i mean cross-border this person of 
populations, diaspora. Oh, yes, the diaspora, absolutely. I mean, there's huge amounts of um, diaspora words um, because uh, it's, it's always travel and communication, which uh, provides everything there. Uh, is, and it's, it's uh, lovely to find all the um, Indian words that, for example, have been uh, transferred into English, things like um, bungalow, which is cognate with Bengali, and uh, just because of the, the um, low style of architecture there. But yes, diaspora is one of the main ways that all, all diaspora, trade, movement, empire, invasion, there's an awful lot of in history. And with those, the Kurgan pit burial people, it's generally thought that the reason they were able to expand like that was that they were the inventors of the chariot. And so they just set off to swarm down into um, everywhere from Britain to northern India in, in their new um, uh, war machines. Uh, but yes, ab absolutely, that's how so many words get moved around to diaspora stuff. Could you please tra trace out the etymology of the game of cricket? Cricket is an insect. Oh, no. Well, no. Cricket is an insect, but in terms of the game of cricket, it comes from a thing called a cricket stool, which was just a little um, stool with three legs that you would sit on. Um, but uh, when the game of cricket first started, um, uh, obviously in a very primitive form, uh, what you would do is you take, um, you needed something to set up for the bowler to aim at, so you would take your cricket stool and put that in the middle of a field, and then you could bowl the ball towards the cricket stool, and hence it became the game of cricket. Okay, okay. then diaspora. <laughs> yes. The etymology of diaspora. And then, um, I mean, there's, there's, uh, here's a classic, that, well, there, there's the classic that the, uh, the Chinaman uh, ball is named after a particular bowler who was from China but played um, for, and I think for, but certainly in the West Indies, and it was his particular style of ball which uh, uh, allowed that. Just picking on the word that you mentioned about that toothpaste, uh, unit of toothpaste. Uh, Nurdle, yes. Yeah, Nurdle, yes. So I'm an electrical engineer, so I have all these units about, you know, voltages and currents and, you know, flux density, <laughs> which is Tesla and all that. So I was just curious about the unit of beauty as it seems to be, you know, perceived these days, which is Helen or Millie Helen, you know? Oh, yes, Can I've heard get, of the yes. Millie Helen, yes. Yeah. Um, if, uh, you... Helen or Troy was the face that launched a thousand ships. You can therefore say that um, one Millie Helen is a girl beautiful enough to launch one ship and so on. It's, it's a, a, a lovely little, um, uh, 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 pretty much a, a joke measurement, but it's a beautiful one. I do like that. <laughs>